Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. It's your favorite AI voice, Phoenix. <laughs> I'm just kidding, it's me. Anyway, if you are new here, or you've been sitting in the shadows, and you enjoy what you're hearing, please come on up and hit that subscribe button. And also, don't forget the notification bell. Set that one to on. That way you'll know every time I upload a video, which tends to be daily. This video is also part of a larger project, so what I will be narrating for you all to listen to will be a murder case from every single state in the United States, so there will be 50 states mentioned. And of course, I had to pay homage to the one and incredibly only Robert Stack. He was the only guy that I watched growing up that scared the ever-living fire out of me. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes, for once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in to get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Unsolved Mysteries, Volume 23. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. Before I read the first case, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer. This video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Warning. Some of these cases may contain material not suitable for all. Listener discretion is highly advised. In 1995, Candace Benton was discovered decomposing in her Alabama apartment with a dog leash wrapped around her neck and looped around her wrists. Authorities claimed that she was not strangled with a leash, but died of asphyxia. They are unsure of her death as a homicide. What happened to Candace? Frances Benton was anxious and worried when her 19-year-old daughter Candace decided to go to college 900 miles away from her hometown in New Jersey. But she knew it would be a good change of pace for Candace. Francis felt that Auburn University in Alabama might be a good place for Candace to get help and understanding with her learning disability. And she was right. Candace was thriving in the town of Auburn, holding down a job at a local Kmart and excitedly was one month away from being an exchange student in Spain, representing the Southern University. Francis remembered fondly Candace's love for Alabama, stating, She just fit in with the South. She had no plans on coming home. When she finished college, she had planned to stay there and teach in the public schools. Francis said that growing up, Candace was called the Little Sunshine Girl because she was so happy and compassionate. When her father was in treatment for cancer, Candace would go around the ward and sing for other patients to cheer them up. Candace's big heart spilled over into a lot of causes. She was an officer in Students Against Drunk Driving, did volunteer work with saving the dolphins and collecting toys for underprivileged children. She kept busy in a lot of other ways too, finding a love for numerous hobbies. Candace was in Girl Scouts, theater, choir, softball, and soccer. She had a love for simply living life. The murder. On July 18, 1995, Frances's worry about not hearing from her daughter for several days began to bubble over. Knowing she could have heard from Candace at that point, she knew something must be wrong and called the police in Auburn in order to have a welfare check put in for Candace. Police made their way to Candace's Lindella Avenue apartment, which they found a strange scene. Candace was lying dead on the floor, decomposing with a dog leash wrapped around her neck and bound around her wrists, behind her back. She was partially clothed. However, they determined that she had not been sexually assaulted or raped. Nothing from the apartment had been taken and had absolutely no injuries to her body, aside from the dog leash wrapped around her neck and wrists. An autopsy determined that she had died of asphyxia. They were wondering if Candace's asthma had somehow played a role in her death, but 
due to her advanced decomposition that was never able to be determined. It was stated in a newspaper article that Chief Ed Downing stressed that she had not been strangled with the dog leash, and they believed that Candace had died on July 14th. Despite the strange scene, her death was never officially classified as a homicide, but detectives seemed to treat it as such, with one officer stating, We are not sure if it was a situation that was intentional or accidental. Investigators sent the evidence to the FBI for a suspect behavioral profile to be made, but have never been publicly stated what had become of that. They also had conducted numerous investigations over the last 28 years. One friend, Stephanie Perry, stated that she was asked extensively about her thoughts on Candace's sexual orientation and, much to Stephanie's surprise, asked how she thought Candace might have died. In 2015, investigators said that they had hopes that new technological advancements might help solve this case, and had hoped that touch DNA might bring about new leads. However, it has never been revealed what had came of this, if any testing had been done at all. Tomorrow marks 28 years since the discovery of Candace's body in her Auburn, Alabama apartment, and sadly, she has yet to receive any justice for her presumed murder. When talking about her feelings on the case 20 years now, Francis stated, I'm not the type of person that needs closure. I don't believe in closure. I just know there is a purpose in life, and I have to go on. Time just flies. In April of 1991, 12-year-old Anchorage, Alaska resident Shauna Twinkie Abon left her home to play with a friend and never returned. Two months later, her remains were found in a stairwell of an abandoned bar. She had died of blunt force trauma to the head. Who murdered Shauna Yvonne? In April of 1991, 12-year-old Shauna Yvonne was settling into her new life in the big city. Shauna had just moved to Anchorage, Alaska from her village in Nunavik Island, located in the middle of the Bering Sea, and was planning to finish out her 7th grade school year at Clark Junior High School before the summer began. Though she was a brand new student, she was steadfast in making friends. One of her classmates, Lena Austin, had this to say about first meeting Shauna. We were both in second grade in Clark Junior High School. She just came in the room and had like this biggest smile on her face like she always did and we just became friends right then and there. Lena had learned a funny little quirk about Shauna on their first day together as classmates. Shauna was known to her family and friends by the nickname of Twinkie. Lena had stated to a local newspaper that she didn't know why exactly Shauna was known as Twinkie, but it was probably due to the fact that she ate so many of them. Lena had noticed that Shauna had succumbed to cultural shock after moving to a big city but the tight-knit friend group she had kept Shauna afloat. In April of 1991, Shauna had come home from a school day at Clark Junior High with a friend, quickly changed her clothes, and left her home again. It's never been stated where she went or who she went with, but Shauna did not return home that night. Shauna's mother, Rose, had concerns when Shauna didn't come home, but this is something Shauna had done before. She had gone missing temporarily, but had always come home shortly after. When enough time passed for that worry to really sink in, Rose took to the streets of Anchorage, putting up handwritten missing poster signs in hopes of finding out where her daughter had gone. When police were contacted, they simply chalked Shauna's disappearance up to a runaway child. Three months later, on June 8th, Shauna's body was discovered. Her decomposing remains were uncovered in a stairwell behind an abandoned bar called the Monkey Wharf 
near 6th Avenue and C Street. Someone had made an attempt to try and hide Shauna's body by covering her with trash, a street sign, and a wooden pallet. An autopsy had confirmed how Shauna had died. She had been killed by blunt force trauma to the head. When Rose was interviewed in late 1991, she said this about the murder. I never thought this would happen to my daughter, Rosa Bond said tearfully. If I had known, I would have had her carry things that would protect her. It hadn't taken long for Shauna's case to turn cold. Only one year later, the police had run out of leads and had nowhere else to turn. One detective had stated that there was a lot of suspects to look at and that in and of itself might have been a hindrance to the case. He claimed that everyone had a theory as to what happened to Shauna and that led elsewhere and nowhere all at once. Now, years later, investigators hope that new advancements in DNA or fingerprint analysis might lead to a suspect. But as of now, the case is very cold, but still an open investigation. The area where Shauna's body was recovered is now an empty dirt lot. Lena had stated that the friend group that Shauna had made when she came to Clark Junior High School is still in touch today. They still see each other and even tell their own children stories about their good friend Twinkie and the memories they all made together. It's still a very raw moment in Lena's life and she's angry that the killer has not been found. 30 years later, and the person who did it to her hasn't been caught. That someone could do that to her and hit her body underneath a board and that she had been beaten so bad, her head, that's that's what killed her, and then hit her body in the stairwell. I know it was several years ago, but it was just like the worst thing ever that we went through. Lena and Shauna's other childhood friends still hold on to hope that her case may one day be solved, but she also stated that she hadn't heard from detectives in over 10 years. All of Shauna's immediate family is now deceased, but... Her friends keep her memory alive. Shauna's name will always be remembered in another way, too. Her name and portrait were etched into a memorial for homicide victims in downtown Anchorage. The memorial bears the name and photo etchings of missing and murdered indigenous women throughout Anchorage, with Shauna's face and name right at the center. The artist, Amber Webb, was interviewed about her work, and she said this about etching Shauna's photo. I don't know that much about her, but I could see that she's just a beautiful little girl, and she should have had a life. The pain that I felt in drawing her portrait was that there was no, there was no darkness there. It was just pure light like a child would have. There's always light reflection in people's eyes, and her light reflection looked like stars, and I remember trying to make sure that I got those stars in there. In May of 2010, Kayleen Gallegos was traveling from Phoenix to Slolo with two friends when they got lost. Kayleen and one friend stayed overnight in the forest before attempting to walk out. Her friend turned around and had lost sight of her, and she has never been seen again. Where is Kayleen? On the evening of May 20th, 2010, 22-year-old Kayleen Marie Gallegos left her father's home in Lakeside, Arizona to travel to Phoenix, Arizona in order to buy some heroin from an unknown source. Kayleen had left her father's home with two men, one man's name has been withheld, and the other man was 20-year-old Jacob Mata. One source had stated that Jacob and Kayleen were a couple, but in the White Mountain Independent article where Jacob was interviewed, he had stated that the two were not in a relationship, and he was actually married to a Phoenix woman, to whom he had a son. Once the heroin was purchased, the unnamed man left the group, and a woman named Jennifer Pettit, 
19 had joined. The trip had begun, the drive back to Sholo, where Jacob and Kayleen had both lived, and they had taken State Route 87, traveling through the town of Payson. Along this drive, the group of friends had gotten confused and then lost, and instead of continuing along State Route 87, they had turned off a Forest Service road in the White Mountain Apache Forest. Once APM rolled around, the group had decided to stop the car in an open clearing to discuss what to do next. Jacob and Kayleen had stated that they wanted to stay put where they were, but Jennifer claimed that she wanted to continue on, claiming that they had a better chance of being found or making it home safely. Jennifer had then taken the car to continue on her way, while Jacob and Kayleen had hunkered down and stayed where they were. They built a fire and spent the night in the forest. They thought that they would have a better chance of being found if they put up a smoke signal, such as the fire. What we learn next is all according to Jacob. The next morning rolled around and the pair had to decide what to do next. Jacob stated that he wanted to continue to stay exactly where they were, but Kayleen had wanted to start walking out of the forest to find the main road and to signal for help. Jacob agreed, and the two began to walk along a side road, which slowly turned into a game trail, for they had lost their sense of direction. Jacob had also stated that the two walked about 15 to 30 yards apart, while they entered a small canyon at around 1 p.m. The pair climbed the side of the canyon when Jacob, who was ahead, climbed to the top of the ridge and spotted a main road. He said that he called out to Kayleen, telling her he found the road, and she called back to him, All right. He then claims he never saw her again. Jacob searched for Kayleen for 40 minutes, before climbing back up the canyon and signaling for help along the main road. Jacob had stopped two separate trucks who he believes were driven by either tribal or forest service people and had asked them both for food, water, and directions. He then stopped a silver truck whom he also asked for directions and let the driver know that he had been with two women who were now unaccounted for one being Jennifer, who left in the car, and the other, Kayleen, who was somewhere within the canyon forest. Jacob believed that this man was a BIA agent who had asked him questions about a forest fire that had resulted from the campfire he and Kayleen had set the night before. The man had also taken photos of his shoes and his face. After this, Jacob said he left the truck and began to walk the service road once again out of the forest. When the sun was setting, Jacob made his way onto the Globe Highway, right outside of Sholo. Once he was on the main road, Jacob spotted police and ran away. He later told an interviewer that this was because he had heroin and meth in his possession. However, Jacob was arrested by police, and it took them about a week to ask Jacob to bring them to the spot where Kayleen was last seen. By this time, Jacob could pinpoint the location he had seen her. When Jennifer was spoken to, she corroborated Jacob's story. It is unclear what had happened to Kayleen. Many people believe that she had died due to the results of foul play that was drug-related, while others believe that she was lost out in the canyon near the Globe Highway. Her body has never been discovered and it is not certain that she is in fact deceased. When last seen, Kayleen was described as standing somewhere between 5 feet to 5 foot 3 inches tall, weighing between 100 to 120 pounds, and wearing a gray tank top, a light brown sweater, dark colored jeans, and flip-flops. She is Hispanic and has brown hair and brown eyes. In 1994, 19-year-old Melissa Witt drove to the local Fort Smith, Arkansas bowling alley to meet her mother for a hamburger. In the parking lot, she was hit over the head and abducted. 
Her body was found in the forest six weeks later. Who murdered Melissa Witt? In 1994, 19-year-old Melissa Witt, known as a Missy to her friends and loved ones, had her whole life ahead of her, and she was excited for the future. Missy was an honor student at West Star Community College in Fort Smith, Arkansas, dedicated to her classes and pushing through to her dream job of becoming a dental hygienist. In fact, she was already beginning to step foot into that role by working part-time at a local dentist office as a dental assistant, learning the tools of the trade. Missy's friends described her as a hard worker, as well as friendly and kind, the kind of friend anyone would love to have. While Missy was in school pursuing her dreams, she lived at home with her mother, Mary Ann. The two were very close to one another enjoying each other's company, and getting through life together. On December 1st, 1994, Missy spent the day at work before returning home and changing out of her clothes. Mary Ann had left Missy a handwritten note stating that she would be at the local bowling alley playing a few games with her bowling league. She mentioned that Missy should meet her there and she would buy her hamburger. Missy, who was low on money, thought this was a good idea and got in her car and headed towards Bowling World, leaving between 6.30 and 7 p.m. Missy made it to the bowling alley that night, but she never made it inside. Her mother grew concerned when Missy hadn't met her for dinner and had contacted police to report her as missing. A few days later, her car was discovered in the bowling alley parking lot. Worryingly, there was a trail of blood that had yet to be washed away by rain, which led from her car through the parking lot to an empty parking space where it was presumed another car had been parked. It was clear Missy had been abducted at that point, but it was confirmed when two witnesses came forward and stated that they had actually witnessed the abduction. Sadly, these witnesses couldn't give police a description of the suspect. Police believe that Missy was struck over the head as she exited her car and was dragged to another car waiting in the parking lot before being driven away. They determined this due to the fact that it appeared a struggle had taken place outside of Missy's car where they had found her keys and an earring lying nearby. Six weeks later, and 45 miles away from Missy's home, two hunters stumbled upon her badly decomposed body in the wilderness of Ozark National Forest. The body was nude and lying underneath a headstone-shaped rock. All of her clothing and belongings were missing from the scene, presumably taken by the killer. It was stated that Melissa had been brutally murdered, strangled to death, and sexually assaulted. A detective said this about the desolate location her body was discovered. She could have screamed as loud as she could, and no one would have heard her. No one has been convicted of Missy's murder. However, two known killers have been looked at as potential suspects. Larry Swearingen and Charles Ray Vine, a.k.a. the River Valley Killer, Larry Swearingen was considered a potential suspect due to the similarities between Missy's murder and a murder that Larry actually committed, the death of Melissa Trotter. Along with their names being the same, their murders were similar too. Both girls were 19, both had been strangled to death, and both had been dumped in the Arkansas wilderness after death. On top of it, Larry was in the Fort Smith area at the time that Missy was abducted and murdered. However, if Larry was involved, any knowledge of what happened to her went to the grave with him. Larry was executed on January 27, 2009 for the murder of Melissa Trotter. Charles Ray Vine, the Valley River killer, was also looked at as a potential suspect. In 1993, Charles raped and murdered Juanita Wofford and then raped and murdered Ruth Henderson in 1995. In the year 2000, he attempted to rape and kill a 16-year-old girl who was saved when her stepfather walked in on the attack and nearly beat Charles to death. 
when the police intervened and Charles was arrested for his crimes. Charles was considered a suspect in the death of Missy as he was an active killer in the area at the time of her death, but his killing style differed in that he beat his victims to death. Charles denied being involved in her death, and the case of Melissa Witt has since gone cold. In 2017, 20-year-old actress Elaine Park left her boyfriend's home after having a panic attack in the middle of the night. She was last seen caught on surveillance, leaving his Los Angeles neighborhood, and her car was found abandoned five days later. She was never seen again. What happened to Elaine? In 2017, 20-year-old Los Angeles resident Elaine Park who was getting a name and face out there, working towards a career in acting and music. Maybe you've seen her before in small roles. She appeared in Elaine was cast in Desperate Housewives, ER, Mad TV, Role Models, and Crazy Stupid Love. When she was gaining traction in movies and television, she was attending college classes at Pierce College in Woodland Hills, California. However, Elaine wasn't always consistent with attending her classes, as life tended to get in the way at times. In fact, in January of 2017, Elaine had not been attending classes at all and had recently been laid off at her job at a local restaurant. Elaine was described as bubbly, energetic, intelligent, and kind. She was also known to keep her private life close to her chest and she suffered from bouts of depression. On the evening of January 27, 2017, Elaine spent some time with her mother before leaving her mom's home and heading to the home of her ex-boyfriend, Divine Compier. Elaine and Divine had plans to see a movie at the AMC Promenade, located in Woodland Hills. The two attended the film before returning home to Divine's home that he shared with his parents roughly around 1 a.m. in the morning, with plans to turn into bed. Three hours later, Divine stated that Elaine woke around 4 a.m. on the 28th having a panic attack. Divine attempted to soothe and calm Elaine, telling her to stay in bed with him until her panic attack passed. However, Elaine refused and she had decided to leave the home. Elaine was caught on surveillance footage, leaving Divine's home at 6.05 a.m., walking to her dark gray 2015 Honda Civic. Authorities would state, however, that they cannot be certain that it was Elaine getting into her car that morning on video footage or if it was someone else. This was the last time Elaine was physically seen, had it been her. Elaine's mother later reviewed the footage of her daughter walking to her car and stated that she did not look panicked or distressed at the time. Elaine's car was last seen leaving the neighborhood's gate on surveillance footage at 7.14 a.m. There is some possible discrepancy here, though. Authorities cannot be certain that the camera's timestamp had been updated since the daylight savings change. So there is a chance that the actual time may have been 6.14 instead. If it was indeed 7.14 that Elaine had left the gated community, her one hour and nine minutes could not be accounted for. Elaine was never seen or heard from again. Five days passed before there was any sign of what had happened to the missing 20-year-old. On February 2nd, 2015, her car was found abandoned in Malibu, California. The car has been parked along the Pacific Coast Highway, opposite of the Malibu Beach RV Park. The car doors were left unlocked and her keys were still in the ignition, but the car turned on. Inside, investigators found her iPhone 7, her older iPhone 6, her laptop, driver's license, backpack, duffel bag, makeup, as well as $37 in cash. Numerous searches were conducted immediately after finding Elaine's car. Search dogs, volunteers on foot, and drones all searched 
to Elaine within the Santa Monica Mountains, Coral Canyon Park, and Angela's National Forest. Nothing turned up that led to any clue where Elaine might have gone. The only noteworthy items found were some items of clothing, but even those could not be conclusively linked to having belonged to Elaine. Divine was spoken to and was considered cooperative, and investigators determined that he did not have anything to do with the disappearance of Elaine Park. With no clues leading to Elaine, one year later, in 2018, the family's private investigator had made a plea. The family was offering a reward for anyone who was able to come forth with any video or picture of Elaine. On January 28th or January 29th, a $1,000 reward was offered for any video or picture from the 28th, and a $250 reward was offered for any video or photo from the 29th. The family stated that if any photo or video submitted led to the whereabouts of Elaine Parks, that the family would be providing a $50,000 reward at the time of her discovery. Elaine has never been found, and it is unclear where she had gone after leaving her car at the Pacific Coast Highway. When last seen, Elaine was described as standing at 5 foot 5 to 5 foot 6, weighing roughly 125 pounds, with waist-length dark hair with blonde tips. She is of Korean descent and wears heavy makeup. She has three tattoos, a cow skull and a moth on her left arm, a dagger and flowers on her right arm, and a rose on her left shoulder. If still alive today, Elaine would be 26 years old. Her family hasn't given up hope of finding Elaine, stating, Elaine, we will find you. I can hear her voice every night saying, Mom, please come find me. It's heartbreaking. Something is going on. We have to find her. In June of 1975, 23-year-old Majori Fithian was found dead on a desolate gravel road in Colorado. She had gunshot wounds to her face, and her 18-month-old son was sitting beside her, holding her hand. Who killed Majori? On June 20th, 1975, 23-year-old Majori Sue Fithian packed a single suitcase picked up her 18-month-old son, Dylan Sage Fithian, and made her way to the bus stop in Greeley, Colorado. Majori and Dylan, who now goes by Sage, had a fun family-oriented weekend planned. They were traveling to Denver in order to spend the weekend with her aunt and uncle, planning to return on Tuesday, June 24th. The pair made it safely to their destination, enjoyed quality time with their family, and on Tuesday morning, Majori's uncle had dropped her off at the bus station to board a bus home to Greeley around 7 a.m. Majori and Sage never made it on the bus. Around 9 a.m. and about 50 miles away from Denver, 24-year-old ranch hand Terry Furnish was working the Painter Ranch in Rogan, Colorado. While his family had managed the ranch for nearly 20 years, he had only been there visiting from South Dakota and just helping out around where he called home. The land the ranch sat on was large and vast, and about one mile into his drive, from one part of the ranch to the other, Terry spotted something. Lying in the gravel road along Weld County Road 386 laid a woman who was not moving. Terry stopped his pickup truck and got out to inspect walking upon a disturbing scene that he states still haunts him to this day. Lying in the gravel, an auburn-haired woman lay motionless with a gunshot wound to her face. Sitting beside her, in a pile of broken glass, sat a small toddler clutching her hand. Panicked and unsure of what to do, Terry picked up the child and moved him out of the broken glass and got back in his pickup truck, knowing that another pickup was only a quarter mile away. 
This truck had a two-way radio, which he could call for help. Terry sped down the dirt road, rushing to make the call, and returned to the boy. He picked the child up and held him close until help arrived. Soon, the Weld County deputies, Colorado state officials, and a handful of other ranch hands arrived on scene. Looking back on the situation, Terry said this to a local paper. I didn't know what to do, he said. I didn't know whether to put him in the pickup truck, but I sent him just out of the glass. You just don't know what would have happened to the little guy and his mom, too. It's just so unfortunate. It was so remote then. The ambulance took a long time, over an hour if I remember right. Officers spread out and canvassed the area. Nearby the woman, they found a spent 25 caliber shell casing. Up the road, they discovered her suitcase. Inside were clothing for her and the child, as well as a slip of paper with a phone number. The number belonged to the woman's mother, Betty, who identified the deceased woman as Majori Sue Fithian. Majori's mother was able to tell police that the young boy with her daughter was her grandson, Dylan Sage Fithian. Police questioned Terry, who stated that he had not seen nor passed any cars along the road that morning. They also asked local residents of Rogan if they had seen Majori or Sage at all that morning. A handful of residents claimed they had seen the car at a cafe having breakfast earlier that day. Other locals claimed to have seen a car in the area around the time of the shooting stating it was an early 1960s model car with a yellow body and a black roof. With no real clues leading to any conclusive direction, theories took hold about what may have happened to cause Majori's death. Some stated that her death was due to drugs. The only thing tying to this loose theory was that Majori had a history of using marijuana, and early on, it was considered that she may have transported drugs from the Greeley area to Denver. This theory was further implemented when a local drug dealer came forward. This man claimed that he had picked up Majori and Sage at the Denver bus station that June morning because Majori was supposed to be transporting for him. This man claimed that Majori failed to produce the drugs or money and that he witnessed another drug dealer kill Majori in retaliation. A year and a half later, this man redacted his statement. In turn, investigators interviewed the man after administering sodium pentothal, or truth serum, where he claimed he had made the entire story up. As it turned out, when the man was first initially interviewed, he was left alone in the interview room with Majori's open case file, where he took it upon himself to read the documents and learn the details of her death. He stated that he has fabricated this story because he was angry at the man he claimed was Majori's killer for narking on him. The idea that Majori may have hitched a ride was also looked at, with no leads panning out in that direction. Her cousins, who were with her the weekend that she was in town visiting, had also been spoken to, but they claimed that nothing out of the ordinary had happened and that they didn't know who could have killed Majori? Sadly, Sage, who is now 50 years old and over double his mother's age when she died, doesn't remember anything about her other than what he learned from family. Sage knows that his mother had a love for the arts. She was a poet, an artist, and absolutely loved music. He stated that his own children have an interest in the arts, which he believes came from his mother. After Majori's death, Sage went to live with his aunt and grandmother. Sadly, no one has ever been charged in the death of Majori's Sufithian, and no justice has ever been served. For the lack of true leads, investigators now believe it is possible she was the victim of a serial killer. However, records show that no serial killer was active during the time and place that Majori was murdered. I wish I knew more. I really do. I've thought about it a thousand times. Had I come up on it right when it happened and the people would have been there 
You wonder what you would have done then because there's probably a good chance you would have been shot at also. It's a sad thing, and you'd like to seek closure, but with it being so long ago, it's a hard thing. But they do that every once in a while. Terry Furnish, 2022. Three years after 34-year-old Diana Ferris was present at the scene of a murder, she and her unborn child were also murdered, beaten, and strangled to death in her Connecticut apartment in April of 1996. Who murdered Diana and her unborn child, and was it related to the murder of Thomas Myers? In 1996, three years had passed since 34-year-old resident Diana Ferris had the traumatizing experience of having been present at the scene of a murder, despite not seeing the killing actually unfold. Three years prior, in 1993, Diana was driving within the city of East Hartford, Connecticut, when she came across a man she did not know, 37-year-old Thomas F. Myers. Myers needed a ride to the Dutch Point housing project, and Diana had agreed to bring him there for unknown reasons. When Diana had briefly left her car with Myers still sitting in it, when she returned to the Blue Mercury Marquis, she found Myers slumped over the passenger side dashboard, bleeding from his chest and left side. The car was still idling. He had been stabbed to death. Diana was reluctant to speak to police, not eager to divulge anything she knew, and Thomas's murder is still unsolved to this day. While there hasn't been a resolution to the case, there is strong suspicion that the murder had to do with drugs. Diana, mother of three children and one on the way, had her own history of drug addiction, particularly with the use of cocaine. In 1996, Diana was five and a half months pregnant and living on her own. At the time, her live-in boyfriend, 41-year-old Harold Rice, was in jail for first-degree robbery, a $50,000 bond set in place. Diana's three children were living with their aunt in another state. Her oldest child, her 16-year-old daughter, Miranda, spoke to her mother nearly every day on the phone. In April of 1996, days had gone by where friends and family were unable to contact Diana Ferris, which was very much unlike her. She often called her children and spoke to their friends by phone. Miranda was worried because every time she called her mother that week, she was getting an endless busy signal. Miranda had been set to visit her grandparents in South Carolina for a week long trip, and she wanted to hear her mother's voice before she left. Unable to get through to Diana, Miranda boarded the plane to her grandparents, hoping they had an idea of where her mother might be and could ease her worries when she got there. When she arrived in South Carolina, that's where she learned some devastating news. Her mother and her unborn sibling were dead. On April 11th, after several concerned phone calls to the apartment complex Diana lived at, a maintenance worker entered her second floor home located at 447 Gaydon Street. Diana was discovered lying sideways in her bed, a blood-covered pillow lying on her face a telephone cord wrapped around her neck. Her hands were bound from attempting to defend herself, and it is believed that she had been dead for days before her discovery. Her five-and-a-half-month-old fetus was pronounced stillborn at the scene. There were signs of a struggle at the crime scene. The phone had been ripped away from the wall, a wire ripped from the wall jack, and lying in the daybed where Diana was discovered. An autopsy concluded that Diana's death was a homicide. 27 years later, and police are still urging the public to come forward with any information they know. Police believe that neighbors had to have seen people coming and going from Diana's apartment. They hope with the passage of time that these witnesses may now feel comfortable coming forward. The only lead they currently have 
is the statements from an unknown man. The man claims that two men he knows confessed to having killed Diana and her unborn child in April of 1996. These men claimed that she was beaten before she was murdered and that they had been looking for drugs that they knew to have been in the apartment. The man signed a witness statement claiming that these details are in fact true and police believe he may be onto something as the details he provided are in line with what police know to be true about the crime scene. Some speculate that the same people involved in Meyer's murder may be the same individual behind the murder of Diana. When Miranda, who is now an adult, thinks back on her mother, she thinks back to her mother's most important goal, to get clean and sober for her children. Miranda said this about Diane to a local newspaper. Her dream always was to get clean and sober, get a good job and get her kids back. If my mother was a pillar in the community, if she was a doctor, a teacher, a lawyer, I feel that maybe the police and community would have cared a little bit more. Miranda had to learn the gruesome details of her mother's death as she grew older, and with each year, her desire for justice grows stronger and stronger. She wants to see her mother's killer be brought before a judge and sentenced for that they have done to her, taking not only her mother from her, but her younger sibling, too. She wants justice for Diana, and she wants justice for her younger brother as well, stating, I think I deserve justice. I think my brothers deserve it, and I think her grandchildren deserve it. I want my day in court to tell them what I think of them. In the fall of 1986, 28-year-old Jane Marie Pritchard visited the Blackbird Forest State Park in Delaware to work on a scientific study of the peanut hog plant. Her partially nude body would later be found killed by two shotgun wounds to her neck and shoulder. Who killed Jane Marie and why? In 1986, 28-year-old Jane Marie Pritchard was working diligently towards her goals and well on her way towards receiving her master's degree in botany at the University of Maryland. Having been raised on a farm in Maryland, Jane Marie grew to love plants and wildlife from an early age, and that passion had followed her through adolescence and into her adult years. After she was to receive her master's in botany, Jane Marie planned for a career as an environmental lawyer. In fact, Jane Marie was only months away from presenting her final thesis, allowing her to graduate. Her thesis was to be on the hog peanut plant, also known as a ground bean, and she was spending a lot of time out in nature observing this plant and the way it grew in nature. Unfortunately, in September of 1986, Jane Marie would take a trip to observe the peanut hog plant in a forest in Delaware and not return home. On Friday, September 19, 1986, Jane Marie hopped into her two-toned Chevy Blazer and made the trip to Smyrna, Delaware to stay the night at a friend's house. Staying overnight allowed Jane Marie to be up bright and early the next morning to work on her studies, and she was back in her car at 7 a.m. on September 20th, heading towards the nearby Blackbird Forest National Park. Taking advantage of the beautiful 74-degree fall weather, Jane Marie was aiming to spend the day observing the way the hog peanut vine would turn its leaves towards the sun, and observing the plant was going to be an all-day process. She parked her car roughly 500 feet from the visitor center along an access road, unpacked her equipment, and walked 100 feet into the forest to begin her work for the day. Jane Marie's logbooks show that she had recorded notes every minute from when she arrived at the state park until 10 a.m. when her notes abruptly ended. Hours went by, the day becoming colder and windier as it went on, and by mid-afternoon, a couple from nearby New Jersey were planning a camping trip in the same vicinity as where Jane Marie 
was recording her data. The couple set up their tent, and once they finished securing it, they were eager to explore the forest surrounding them. The pair began a hike along a dirt trail, and a bit into their walk, they spotted something out of place, away in the underbrush, roughly 20 feet off the trail. Veering off the path and into the bush, they came across the lifeless, partially clothed body of Jane Marie, surrounded in blood. They quickly alerted authorities to their discovery. The autopsy had concluded that Jane Marie had been shot twice in the back of the neck and once in the shoulder with a shotgun and died from blood loss. Authorities got to work speaking to witnesses, and they had many, mostly men who had been hunting in the area for squirrels that morning. Despite this, investigators were quick to rule out an accidental shooting or hunting accident. One man, 28-year-old Michael Lloyd, came forward on the following Monday to speak to police, claiming that he himself had spoken to Jane Marie, and curiously, he had also seen her speaking to another man that same day. He claimed this man was white, of average height and build, with medium brown hair and a beard, and had been wearing blue jeans and a brown jacket. Using this description, police had put together a composite sketch of the unknown man and distributed it to the public. The generic-looking sketch wasn't much to go on, but authorities also had other evidence to work with. They had collected hair and fibers from Jane Marie's body, and one of these hairs did not belong to her, but most likely belonged to the killer. They also spoke over and over again with key witnesses, including Michael Lloyd, whose story has now begun to change and morph from his original account. On October 3rd, Michael Lloyd was put under arrest for the murder of Jane Marie Pritchard. In 1986, DNA testing was in its infancy. In fact, it was the very same year that the first ever criminal case was contributed to DNA testing, having been a key factor in solving a crime. In England, at the time, there was only one lab in the United States that was able to do DNA testing, which was located on the other side of the country, in California. With only one single hair and a long journey ahead, investigators couldn't take any chances. They boarded a plane with a hair in tow and made their way to California. In August 1987, the DNA report had been returned to Delaware, and it held a surprising revelation for investigators. The single hair had not belonged to Michael Lloyd, and he was subsequently released after spending 10 months at Gander Hill Prison, where he was being held without bail. Once Lloyd was released, police went back over their nearly 300 interviews and pleaded to the public for new, fresh leads. While some trickled in, they ultimately went nowhere in the end, and Jane Marie Pritchard's case has long grown cold. Her case belongs among many others in Newcastle County's cold case unit which was established in 2014. Investigators are hoping that, with advances in technology, along with new sets of eyes looking at the case, that Jane Marie Pritchard's murder may one day soon be solved. The cold case unit claims that Jane Marie's evidence folder contains a lot of physical evidence that is able to be further tested. Jane Marie's memories live on past her death, though, the botanical gardens where she worked while attending university put a plaque up in her honor, and her professor at the University of Maryland had finished Jane Marie's thesis on the hog peanut plant for her. Her family, including her brother Keith, whom she was very close to, still hold out hope that one day her murderer will be brought to justice. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true unsolved mysteries. Before I go any further, I would like to give a very special shout out to the elite members of Back to Ashes. Mrs. Innerscare, Sugared Spikes, Samantha Place, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Amy Klimko, Chris Helius, Tina Mead, 
Cindy, Anita B, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Luz Crispin, Patty's niece, Denise S, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all so much for your continued support. As I've always said, without a supportive audience, I would not have a voice. Thank you. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed these cases. In the meantime, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.